McKenzie, space again, gets the pass away for Lampy! Kia ora and welcome to the first All Black podcast for 2022 and it is a massive year for our teams in black. The All Blacks have Ireland here for three tests in June, rugby championship as usual, end of year tour to the Northern Hemisphere. The Black Ferns hosting the Rugby World Cup here in New Zealand in October and November. Our Black Ferns and All Black Sevens are defending their gold medals at the Com Games as well as the Sevens World Cup in South Africa. That's just a few of the things in the calendar for 2022. I'm glass half full. They're going to be full houses, uninterrupted, no COVID, and we're going to cover all of this and so much more on the podcast. First pod for 2022 and when you have your first pod you go big that's what I'm told anyway you go real big and it doesn't get much bigger than 92 games for the All Blacks World Cup winner 51 tests as All Black captain 63 consecutive test matches which I think at least is definitely a New Zealand record potentially a world record still today and that's just a few of this man's achievements welcome to the studio Sean Fitzpatrick thanks Rob pleasure to be here Mate, we, it's, it's a great career you've had, and we're going to go through a lot of it, but we can't get into it straight away without a bit of a warm-up. So I'm going to throw a few questions at you, mate. Just um, what I need. Yeah, just so uh, we can get to the, know you a little bit better. But um, first one, mate, uh, All Black Hero growing up for you? Well, I sort of, you know, you look back, and I, I was, my father was an All Black, so he was probably my hero. Of course. <laughs> Although I never saw him play live. Um, but I, you know, the, the Colin Meads, um, ironically, and I, I don't say this too often, uh, the British and Irish Lions had a, yeah. had a real effect on, on sort of my generation, really, because they, you know, they came to, to New Zealand in the early 70s and the Gareth Edwards of the world, the Barry Johns, those sort of players had a real effect. But, you know, Grant Batty, Brian Williams, Bill Osborne, uh, those sort of players. Yeah. Uh, Grant Batty came to our rugby club, College Rifles, in, uh, in Remuera in Auckland uh, when I was probably five, six years old. And my God, he looked like a man mountain, although he's only, he was he's only quite yeah. a small man. Just to, to see a, a live, living legend yeah. uh, was just phenomenal. And, you know, we, you know, Brian Williams, that, that tour to, to Africa in 70, 71, was yeah. it? Um, you know, on those hard, hard grounds. Yeah. Uh, so we all practice, you know, those side steps, that metre side step, all that. So, yeah, I just think in general, the, the All Blacks really, yeah. uh, they were such, such icons um, to us as, as kids growing up. Mate, Grant Batty would run just as fast to a scrap with the Fords as he would to a try in the corner, wouldn't he? He was the ultimate sort of uh, the tough guy at the yeah, time. Yeah, he boxed above his weight, didn't he? <laughs> oh. But uh, just very, very passionate and, uh, and obviously loved being, being in the All Blacks. First All Black game you went to, can you remember? I think it was 1976, believe it or not. Yeah, I believe um, it. Uh, it was Scotland. Uh, and at Eden Park, and it was actually the the flood test when they oh, had the yeah. the flood, and BG scored that try. Uh, I think we sat in the terraces, my dad and I, um, in the sort of the uh, what is it, the uh, the west northwest corner. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, just a, a, ni- a nice memory, really. Oh, mate, so appropriate a place that you ended up playing so many games at for for Auckland and the Blues and the All Blacks. So you know, pretty special that you yeah, saw your I first never, game there. I never thought that would uh, be the case, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was a nice, nice memory. Uh, favorite current All Black of the guys going around at the moment, and I'm sure you still watch um, with I, a keen eye. Yeah, I sort of I see a bit of them round, and you know, obviously when when they're in the UK, I sort of catch up whenever I can. Um, but you know, they they I'm so proud of what they've achieved of of the years gone by, and and currently my favourite All Black. Oh, I don't know, there's there's so many of them. Honestly, they they are so good. Um, you know, I I love what Aaron Smith done has yeah. done. He's he's become a real pro, um, and had longevity. Um, you know, Brody Retallick probably the forwards, and uh, Aaron Smith in the backs. Nice, I like it. A few backs in there, good to hear. And uh, favourite rugby ground? You played at so many all over the world here in New Zealand, and and, and almost every uh, yeah. you know major rugby ground going. You know, any yeah. any favourites? I loved uh, loved Carisbrook in the old days when yep. the old Carisbrook. That was uh, that was good fun. Um, the grounds in New Zealand being multi-purpose. Um, I love you know obviously Eden Park has special memories for me, but I love the traditional rugby grounds and and South Africa yeah. um, for me you know Kings Park and Durban. 
um, was just phenomenal when we played there in '92. I'd never seen a ground like it. Right on top, of you, aren't yeah. Yeah, right on top. Of you. Newlands and Cape Town's the same. Yeah. Um, but I suppose if I had to pick one favourite, it'd be Loft- Loftus first felt for yeah. for obvious reasons. That yeah. you know we won our series there in '96, yeah, yeah. and it's like any golf course. You know yeah, as much yeah, as anyone, yeah, yeah. the golf courses you love are the ones you play well at. Hundred percent. And uh, although Alice Park has you know lots of lots of great memories, um, I'd sort of move that aside and put uh, Loftus first vote on there. Yeah, I love it. Um, best All Black you played with, and I know this is this is a really tough question because there, there were yeah. plenty, but if you had to single out one or two, you know, could you do that? Yeah, I just, God, cause, and, and as you get older, you sort of, we, we still spend a lot of time together, you know, and, you know, I, I always say if I had to go to war tomorrow and I had to pick one guy, I'd, I'd take Zinzan, yeah. uh, Brooke, just, just purely because he was so multi-talented. Uh, had a huge passion for the All Black jersey, uh, but probably all and above all of that, he, he loved winning and and yeah. and getting better at what he did. So it would probably be Zinni. You know, Michael Jones is another one that could play in any position. You know, the peak of his powers in sort of '87, '88, uh, before he got injured. Uh, he could have played in literally any position yeah. in the team <laughs> and and been a rock star. Yeah. So you know those two are, are pretty hard to go by. What about um, players you played against? Anyone of of real note in the opposition which uh, you know you you admired and thought was yeah, super I, talented? I, obviously, Australia in my early days they were very good. Uh, you know that team they had in '91 was outstanding. So you know the Tommy Lawtons, the, the Phil Kearns, the Far Jones. I just thought he was an exceptional leader, a great halfback. You know Noddy Liner at ten, uh, very good. But I, I suppose being a forward, uh, the people that had a real influence on my career were the French. Yep. Uh, just purely the scrummaging technique, um, Don Trans, De Broca, uh, those players, Pascal Ondant, uh, Jean-Pierre Garraway, the tight head prop, um, just just phenomenal players, uh, but good people off the field, yep. and that's what I, that's what I love. That's what I love now. Being retired, you know, going going down to Beirut's and and staying with Jean-Pierre Garraway and Pascal Ondant and Serge Blanco's there, and yep. and they just had that team they had in sort of the the, the mid '80s and even you know that World Cup team in '87 was a, a very good team. Played their final and the semi-final yeah. against Australia. One came of the great games. Park. Yeah. Um, but they they when they played rugby, um, they were as good as anyone in the world. What about um, best sporting event you've ever been to? Non-rugby. You know you've probably been um, fortunate enough to get along to a number of great sporting events. Is there one that sticks in the mind as, yeah. as the best? I, yeah, we're very fortunate. Um, we got a lot, living in, in the Northern Hemisphere now, we got a lot of events. Um, I, I love the tennis, I love the French Open, uh, I love Wimbledon. Uh, the French Open's a bit more fun, I think. Um, but ironically, uh, the game we lost in the uh, the 50, 50 over game at, no. yeah, <laughs> at Lords. Um, in you were ter- there, you were there for the World the, Cup yeah, cricket we final. And just, the roller coaster of emotions throughout the day, oh. and no one ever predicted it was going to finish like that. Oh. But to, but to be there and and to, as you say the up and downs, but to be at the Lords, the home of yeah. cricket, yeah. and to see a game like that and played by two sides who had massive respect for each other. Yeah. And I, you know the way Kane Williamson and the guys held their held their composure at the end, uh, took it on the chin, uh, spoke superbly. Um, but everyone walked away with, you know, we've just experienced one of the greatest sporting events ever. Uh, and, it was unbelievable we sporting yeah. theatre, wasn't it? Yeah. It's 6am in the morning here, you didn't know what yeah. to do you do with yourself at the end of that. But it was, um, like you say, it was two high quality teams going at it at yeah. the, at the and, home of the sport. And a very respectful crowd. You know, you, you, and, and that's what I love about rugby also. You know, I've been to every World Cup final, either as a player or watching it. And, you know, that's what, a great stat. What we saw, what we saw and in Japan in 2019. Yeah. You know, that the semi, well, the quarters, semis and final. You watched with Francois yeah. Pienaar, didn't you? Yeah, the, we did. Yeah, unreal. watched that. And, you know, just just an amazing uh, atmosphere to be in and, and a crowd that was so appreciative of it. Yeah. What about your, you're a keen golfer. I'm lucky enough to have a couple of rounds of golf with you. If you could assemble three other human beings for your ultimate golfing four ball, who would they be? Oh, golly. Um, I've never met him, but I'd I'd love to meet Jack Nicklaus. Yep, brilliant. Um, I'd love to love to, you know, he, what he you know what he did and how they transformed the game. I'm I'm very fortunate, Laureus, that I, I know Gary Player very well, um, 
and I and I speak to him regularly actually. Uh, but he is a great, a great uh, confidant, a great uh, advisor on life. Yeah. Because uh, he's had so many experiences. Oh. And 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 one of the, one of the greats. So yep. those two would be great. And then my all-time hero in terms of uh, actors <laughs> is another Jack, which is uh, which is Jack Nicholson. Oh, yeah, good. Uh, so I think that'd be quite a good quite a good four ball. Well, that'd be brilliant. Three guys to play with, mate. That'd be an outstanding four ball. What about if uh, Sean Fitzpatrick is driving to Golf Harbour Country Club to have a lesson with Cam Jones? What's on the Spotify playlist? What's getting played, mate? <laughs> Cam Jones would like that. Um, I'm a bit of a Fleetwood Mac fan. Oh, I like yeah. it. Yeah, yep. so Very good. the rumours, rumours album of the of the yep. mid seventies. Yep. Um, and I think probably probably Dreams yep. would be my one that would get me going. Outstanding, yeah. timeless, timeless yeah. classic. Yeah. And, and last, I'd, ironically, yeah. we used to drive the kids to school when they were young. We would play all these yep. all these Fleetwood Mac songs. Yeah. And you know a bit of Neil Finn and Split Ends. And ironically. Those are the songs that yeah. are their favourites now too. Hundred <laughs> percent, yeah. Uh, Neil Diamond and yeah. all those classics are on yeah. my playlist because the old man played them. Hundred yeah, percent, like exactly. that's that's how it works. Yeah, I'm sure you've had many pieces of advice, good and bad, over your long and storied career. Best piece of advice you've ever received, or, or one of? Um, I think age is a great, a great, <laughs> a great learning. A great learning as you get older, you get wiser. Uh, hopefully, you get better. Um, I think probably when I became All Black captain. I, I tried to be be somebody else yep. uh, that I wasn't, and uh, one of our great managers was a guy called John Sturgeon from the West Coast, a great coal, coal miner. Yeah, and he came into my bedroom. I think it was on a Friday night before we were playing Ireland on the Saturday in, in uh, Dunedin, and he said, "Fitzy, this is after my third test." He said, "Fitzy, how are you enjoying this gig?" I said, "To be honest, Sturge, I bloody can't stand it." <laughs> I said, "I just hate it." He said, "You know why you hate it?" And I said, no, Sturge, why don't you tell me? And he said, because you're not being your bloody self. There it is. He said, just be yourself. Yep. And it's the best advice I can give anyone. And you think of the the most satisfied people who who um, are happy in their own skin. And, and as soon as you can be happy in your own skin, yep. that's when you're the best person you can be. Yep. Uh, so that's my advice to you know, anyone, just you know, yeah. be yourself. Yeah. Don't try and be somebody else. Mate, that's awesome. Uh, from a yeah. true blue Kerry from the West Coast, isn't it? That's yeah. brilliant. Um, I think we're still lost in this outrage. <laughs> <laughs> but you're yourself. Like yeah, a, exactly. Yeah. Geez, want to get into your career. And one thing that you really notice when you're starting to prepare prepare for this is obviously it was a, long, obviously it was a, a really long career. But, um, geez, you, you went through some of the most significant things in rugby. Mm. You know, like... The baby blacks, you know, mm. these are all things we'll talk about through the course of the interview. But, you know, playing your first test match mm. because, you know, 10, 15 guys are banned from playing rugby for yeah. a couple of games. First World Cup mm -hmm. that there ever was in 1987 here at home. Mm. Rugby turning professional. Playing South Africa, re, you know, as they are mm. reintegrated back yeah. into international rugby, mm. you were part of their first game. You know, rugby turning professional, massive deal that that was. Like, mm. these are some of the most landmark yeah, yeah. Um, moments True. in rugby. Mm. You must, you know, actually, over the course of a 10 or 11 year rugby career you saw it all like do you ever reflect on that and think my goodness like there's um you know some pretty well, significant yeah. moments in rugby or, or you just I haven't move? really sort of thought about it like that but when, now you, when you say that yeah sure I've had some um interesting times and you know I never I grew up never thinking I'd be an all black yeah you know, I wasn't I wasn't like Richie in in terms of you know had these signs on the wall and written things in a little book I'd never done that. Yep. I, I just, I just, and my father said to me, he said, son, just play a team sport and make sure you bloody enjoy it. <laughs> and, and that was probably the best advice I'd give any kid yep. uh, growing up is just enjoy what you do. Play any sport, Dad said. He said, you can go play cricket, play rugby, play football. Um, just do anything. And, and, and ultimately, as, as life went on, um, from being a, a fat kid who, who, didn't play with his mates because I was too heavy in those days. You hopped on a set of scales, whatever weight you were, that was the team you played in. Yep. And then ult ultimately, I, I started to realise that I had potential and and tried to make a fist of it. Yep. But it, was, it literally wasn't until I started playing for the university club as a in the under 21s, yep. you know, that Graham Henry, who was our coach in the mm -hmm. senior team, I, I went from, I played one year under 21s and then, then went into the seniors at, I don't know, 19, 20 years old. And Graham Henry actually looked at me and he said, Fitzy, he said, if you 
drank a little less and stopped smoking. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, Grant Fox was standing next to me. He said, he said, Fitzy and Foxy, if you two actually drank a little less, stop smoking because we were yeah. both smoking. Yeah. He said, you could be an all black one day. And we both looked at each other and went, don't be so bloody stupid, Ted. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and it wasn't until a week later we were playing for the New Zealand Under-21s down at Marlborough against Marlborough. Marlborough and, uh, and we walked out the field and we'd just beaten them, playing for the New Zealand Under-21s. And Colin Meads came up to us, yeah. Foxy and I. And he said, Grant and Sean, my name's Colin Meads. I'm the head of the All Black Selectors. He said, if I was picking an All Black team tomorrow, you two would be in the team. Oh, wow. From the big man. Yeah, we went back to the change room, we're having a cigarette discussing this. And I said, Foxy, I'm going to stop smoking because I want to be an all black. He said, Don't be so stupid, you'll never be a bloody all black. And and ironically, Foxy became an all black a year later. Yeah. And it took me another three years. Um, But it was almost that light got turned on by Pine Tree. Yeah. Um, Give it a bloody go. Yeah. And. it was a, you know, I'd, I had real difficulties. My line out throwing was terrible. John Hart kicked me out of the Auckland team. He said, you're not playing for Auckland until your discipline is better and you learn how to throw the bloody ball in. Andy Hayden told me to bugger off. He said, until you can learn how to throw the ball in. And, and it wasn't, you know, my old mate John Drake at the university club, but tight head property, sadly Drake, he's no longer with us. Um, he said, go and ask that guy you played against tonight, Kevin Boyle. Uh, how to throw the ball in. So I went over to Boyle, and I'd, I'd never met him before. I said, Kevin, uh, my name's Sean Fitzpatrick. I played against you tonight. Yeah. Um, John Drake has said, I, you could teach me how to throw the ball in. And he went, bugger off. <laughs> went, went back over to Drake, and I, I said, Boyle's told me to go away. And uh, he said, did you buy him a beer? I said, no. So I went and bought him a jug of beer, and Boyle said, meet me down at the bloody Auckland Domain in front of the grandstand on Monday night and bring your own ball, and I'll teach you how to throw the ball in. My God. And we did that for a year, every Monday night. And um, got there. at the end of November that year, Andy Hayden turned up. He said, I hear you've been doing a bit of work with Boyle. I'd like to help you. And that was, you know, that was, the, that was almost the turning. And then, as you said, the Cavaliers in 86, which gave us, I gave you know twelve yeah. of us an opportunity, and the reason you had to to do all that work is because you weren't a hooker from day dot, were you? You actually no, you started no. a prop, and yeah. was it Drake who someone and said that maybe yeah. you should move over to hooker because you're getting a bit too yeah. good? <laughs> <laughs> I was a t- I was a tight head prop, and I I played you know um, at, at a school, Australia school, as a tight head prop, and uh, and literally it was it was Drake who said you need to be a hooker, and, and that's what Graham Henry said. He said because Drake had been playing in France. And that's what they were using the, the three props as, yep. as you know in the front row, um, and that's how it started. And that's and that's why we had we had such a dominant front row at Auckland, you know, with Steve McDowell, Drake, Eve, Peter Fatty, Loafer, yeah. um, those guys um, made made a difference. Mate, it's amazing, and it's amazing. Sometimes it's it's not what's what's said, but who says it. And when you mm. get you know people like. Andy Hayden, Sir Colin Meads, etc., yeah. um, delivering a few pointed messages. That's when you stand up and, and listen, it was, and it changes yeah. a bit of behaviour, doesn't it? And I think so. And I, I, you know, I look at I look at rugby now, and I look at you know the way they're coached and stuff. And our day it was a bit of tough love. Yeah. And and if you didn't if you didn't knuckle down and you know I used to take I used to take a rugby ball. My poor wife, <laughs> Bronnie, Bronnie, literally everywhere we went, I had a rugby ball. You know, and yep. she'd she'd been told by Boyle, he said, bring your buddy, bring your girlfriend next week to training, and I'll show her what I want to see from you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we'd be sitting at dinner, and I'd be sitting here going like this, you know, and she'd go, no, you need to move your hand over a bit better, or you need to, you know, all. The, Thanks, honey. <laughs> yeah, and we're at the beach, I'd be line out throwing at the yeah. beach, and. Well, that's a mate. It became though. Yeah. It became a strength. It became yeah. an asset. It became one of the parts of your game that you were known for. Back in the days when there was no lifting and the, no. the margin for error yeah. was tiny, and you had to Thank hit you. your man, didn't Thank you? Thank you. So they, they still they still don't agree. <laughs> <laughs> the AJ Wettens of the world yeah. and those still guys. Crooked for it, see, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah oh, exactly. Mate. But those messages, that hard work, you know, whether it was to Bronny in the kitchen or or whether it was down the beach, it worked, mate. And but I think and I think I think Robert's the same as today. Um, yeah. it's your responsibility. Yeah, if you want to be an All Black. You got to be the best at what you do, yep. and I always look at Foxy. You know, Foxy, Andy Hayden, he'd have him there two hours before training, yep. saying, "I want it twelve meters and twelve meters and seven in from the touchline." Yeah, you know, and Foxy in those days they place kicked. That's exactly where Andy wanted it. 
Yeah. Yeah. Twelve meters and yeah. seven meters in from the touchline. Off the sand. Yeah. 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 Oh, I mean, and, and that's why I became such a. That's Foxy was an outstanding kicker. Oh, May he was a match know? winner. That's yeah. what he was. Like, yeah. There were so many All Black games yeah. we can point to where he, he won us. And we all, we all said that. That's your responsibility. I don't want to have to worry about the line that's thrown. Yeah, I don't yeah, want to worry yeah. about what Michael Jones is going to do, where he's going to run. Foxy, you get that bloody kick. Yep. You know, that's your job. Uh, I mean, we'll talk about this later, but I think it's <laughs> you're hinting on a theme around. It was it was professionalism or elements of mm. professionalism before the game went professional. You know, yeah, it was it I was so. um, yeah. you know putting in the extras. But there's you did um, make your All Black debut in pretty unique circumstances. You know, we had the Cavaliers tour, and because of that tour to South Africa, we had a number of players who weren't able to be selected for a period mm. of time for the All Blacks. We created an opportunity. We rolled out against the French, like you say, pretty ferocious side at the time. Yeah. Big units who you know. Um, hugely physical, you know, tads of thuggery, and and yeah. um, but really good rugby players as well. And we had to put out a side with eleven or twelve debutants, of which you were one. Do you remember the the phone call or like how how did we do it then? Was well, it was, was it the radio? Was there an announcement? Like I, what was the go? I played on a uh, I played on an All Black trial in Blenheim, <laughs> and I was up against Ian Abercrombie, who oh. was the current Auckland hooker. I was I don't think I was even the reserve in those days. I think Hooker Reed or one of them was yep. uh, John Mills, uh, and I got out of the blue. I got picked to play in the Possibles. I think I was or the Probables. Pro- possibles. I was a white team. Abba was in the, and we then flew back to Wellington, waiting in Wellington to get the connecting flight up to Auckland, and they announced announced the team, and I was in the reserves, and Bruce Hamara. Yep. Uh, was Manu was two the, man, yep. the starting hooker from Manawatu, two, and I was just like, wow. I was, and, you know, I was also embarrassed. I was almost embarrassed because Abba, Abba was there, yeah, and yeah, yeah. and and obviously I was I was hugely lucky, I think, because Brian Lahore had been our coach at yeah. under sixteens and under twenty ones, um, so I think he he knew, you know, what I was probably capable of, um, which wasn't a lot in those days, <laughs> and we went down to Christchurch. And assembled, I think, on the Wednesday in those days. Because then, you know, they basically named a team, didn't they? They named a starting 15 yeah. and some reserves, like sort of... Uh, we had oh. 21. There was 21 of us. 21, yeah. yeah. And You were uh, down yeah, to be reserves. one of the reserves. I was a reserve, yeah. yeah. And uh, Kevin Borovich, uh, Kirky was our captain, David Kirk, yep. who was my captain at university. Yep. Um, and we went down and... You know, on the Wednesday, we, we I, was, I was rooming with a guy called Joe Leota. Oh, no, Joe, yeah, yeah. absolutely so, from Canada, and yeah. he was like a he was like a legend yeah. in those days. And we went to went to went to lunch. I can still remember. And we sat down, and uh, and Andy Earl was sitting over there. And he was a, he was a, even in those days, he yeah. was a bit of a legend. Yeah, and hard as nails. Hard, and man. and I can see. And then Joe was, and and I was sort of. Trying to catch Andy Earl's eyes so we could sort of, like, sort of introduce myself. And uh, Joe went, uh, uh, Wurzel, um, <laughs> this is my roommate. Uh, uh, what was your name, mate? <laughs> I mean, uh, Sean Fitzpatrick. <laughs> but literally, that we didn't even know each other. Mate. It was just it's a different time, how we came together. Had Arthur, we had some key, key players. We had Arthur Stone. Yep. Uh, we had Kirky, obviously. Uh, but the rest of us, we had Borrow. Uh, Brian McGrath was in the front row. Was JK one of the debutants? JK, no, no, JK oh, had been in there since played. '84. Yeah, uh, yep. went to Australia in '84. Uh, so JK, I think there was three or four that had played a test before. Yeah, and yeah, you know, on the Wednesday we, we had live scrummaging, and uh, uh, Bruce Brucey Hamara popped a couple of ribs. Friday, you're he, on. <laughs> uh, it wasn't a Friday. Friday, BJ came to me and said, uh, "Brucey's not going to start. You're going to have to start." I was like, wow, wow, really? <laughs> and I was pig. I was so scared, like these guys. They're the Five Nations champions, the French. Yeah. yeah. They had Rodriguez, all these, oh, Huge gnarly, man. oh, my God. And uh, <laughs> anyway, we somehow, I don't know how we beat them. Honestly, I still to this day, I don't know how we beat them. Yeah. Just because every scrum borrower was getting tipped over, we were getting screwed backwards and forwards. I was going to ask you, what are the memories of the game? Like, oh, even just, even doing the hucker with, you know, 11 or 12 guys who had never done it before yeah. and trying to and we didn't look intimidating. No, <laughs> no like, they were just like, almost <laughs> laughing at us like these young kids. But ironically, BJ Lahore just built this belief that we could beat anyone. Yeah. You know, he, said, he, said to, he said to the team, he said, on Friday, he said on Wednesday it was a joke. He just thought, there's no <laughs> one. These guys are going to lose by 100 points. Yeah. And then by Thursday we got a bit more confident. And then by Friday he said, 
I think you can beat France. There it is. And and we did. And then we almost went and beat Australia the following week. And then we all got dropped. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember the, the jersey? You know, do you remember... Receipt, like how did you receive yeah, it? Then? it do you remember of, putting it on, and, and were you thinking a yeah. bit of a pretender, or like, right, this is no, I've got I a chance here, just, and have I a crack? S- I can still remember. I can still remember. As soon as that whistle, I never thought I was an All Black yep. until that whistle went. Yep. And I can still remember running over the halfway line. Hey, Jesus, I'm an All Black now. Here we go. Which is like wow, well, number eight hundred and seventy-one. That's my All Black number. Yep. And and that jersey will remain as yeah. my favourite jersey. So good. Um, and I've still got it. It's just, yeah, it's one that will never go anywhere. Yeah, where is it? Place. Um, I've actually got it in London. Brilliant. Uh, keep it nearby. So yeah. it's actually we've got a box at London that's in there. So, mate, and that was that was the ultimate prelude to the first World Cup that we ever had, 1987. Um, and again, like a lot of the players who were sort of blooded, I suppose, mm. um, and that French series came through and and made the 87 World Cup. And um, you know, it was actually. Another excellent player that got injured that created an opportunity mm. for you to be a, a massive part of that tournament. Do you remember? Um, you know, was it the same sort of thing? Did you assemble three days before the World Cup as well for for such <laughs> we, a significant um, tournament? Was that what you were still doing then? Well, I think Rob, just before that, we went in in '86. Yep. We went to France. Yep. And uh, we there was a number of the sort of the the old Cavaliers sort of crew yep. still around. Um, and I think that was a real eye opener for us as a team, and, and for me as a as a young player on that team, yep. just to see the different dynamics on the team. That some are good, some are bad, and it taught me a lot of lessons about. You know, I sat on the bench for those three Bledisloe Cup games, um, just to sit back and, and observe without me really knowing that it was actually having a real effect on, on, on my future in terms of yeah. how I would. Um, lead teams I suppose yeah um, so that was that was good and then going to France um, and we had a we had a really good team but then we got beaten up uh, in that final test in Nantes in 86 got the Battle of Nantes it was yeah, called it was just a blood battle, literally it? yeah we just got literally beaten up yeah. and, and then there was there was a number of changes after that um, in 87 when we came back and you know we the World Cup wasn't we didn't really know if it was going to happen or it wasn't yeah and literally as you said we had a, had a trial on the on the Saturday, uh, they named the World Cup team at Wangarei. I think we signed 200 Steinlager balls. That was a big <laughs> thing. Wow, we're signing God. Who's getting this money? Well, you know, it was all those sort of yeah. stupid questions. And then we, as you said, we assembled, we departed, and we assembled back on the Wednesday before the Italian game. Yeah, Started the World Cup. And BJ, BJ Lahore uh, couldn't get there because he got snowed in on his farm and, and oh in the God. wire wrapper. The coach couldn't get there. So, yeah, and as you said, uh, poor old uh, Andy Dalton injured himself, yeah. uh, who was the, the captain, and um, ended up ne- not playing another game in the World Cup. It's so hard to believe. And, and you came in um, as a reserve hooker, played mm. all the games, I believe, and yep. you didn't even, back then, you didn't even bring in another hooker. You just you just carried Steve, the squad as it was. Steve, yeah, Steve, well, because in those days, if you brought somebody in, you, you know, that was, I think, you had to, that that other player had to lead the team, yeah. Um, so we didn't really want that, and because Andy Andy was available, sort of semi final time, I think, or yep. might have been quarter final. Um, but I always say, and I take my hat off to Andy. He was inspirational yep. um, to be able to sit there on the bench, and and you know he was thirty six years old, um, and just be so professional uh, in terms of what he did uh, off the field, in terms of helping me really. Yeah, and there's. And there's sort of periods along in our all-black history where it feels like change is created, like you say, in 87. Mm-hmm. Um, there's some, some new players brought in, people like Michael Jones, you know, John Gallagher, guys who really lit up the World Cup. Um, did you have an inkling leading into that tournament that you're about to do something pretty special? Because the style was brilliant. Like, it mm-hmm. was for the time, you know, I might be wrong, my memory might be wrong, but the, but the game was a little bit dour, quite kick-based um, yep. through there, like you say, very physical at times, Pretty brutal, but but we played a pretty expansive style yeah, with John so. Kerr and Craig yeah. Green, John Gallagher. You know, um, I think we were almost ahead of our time, Rob. Those, yeah. you know, we I don't think we intentionally tried to play that rugby. Yeah. Um, but we just we had a unique group of guys who um, were superbly fit. Uh, it was a perfect time for us in terms of the year, the calendar. Yeah. It was June, the middle of the year. It was right at the start of our season almost. We'd had yeah. the fresh had, and had, ready had, to go. Yeah, had the Auckland games and. 
provincial championship and that sort of stuff. So we were fresh and ready to go, and we had exceptional talent. You know, without without knowing it, that Michael Jones would be one of the greatest All Blacks ever. Yeah. You know, JK was on fire in '87. Uh, John Gallagher came into the team, Craig Green, just, you know, all these names, Warwick Taylor in oh, the no, midfield, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just guys that just did their job. Joe Stanley at 13, Steve yeah, you know, yeah, Stevie yeah. McDowell, Drake, Even Kirk, he was Drake brilliant, wasn't he? Murray Pierce, Gary Wetton, Alan Wetton, yeah. Buck, you know, and yeah. then and then we had the Zinzan Brooks and the Bernie McCarhills and uh, Bruce Deans, those sort of players that just when they came in, uh, they really put pressure on everyone else, yeah. and and we actually got on really well. We, yeah. had, we had good fun. Um, BJ had made a real effort. He said we have to make an effort to win back the fans. Yeah. Uh, because after what happened in terms of the Cavaliers, that yeah. you know, seventy percent of New Zealand had turned off against rugby. Yeah. Um, so we had to try and win them back. So he said we're going to go to the community. Uh, we're going to train at schools. We're going to. Get you billeted. We're gonna. We went, we went we're gonna back get to, you billeted. Talk me through that, mate. So I, we I thought this story was before the tournament, but I'm yeah. actually thinking maybe no, it we wasn't. Played our, <laughs> we played our last pool game against Argentina and Wellington, and our, our quarter final was against Scotland and Christchurch. So on the Sunday, we just BJ just we just assumed we were flying to Christchurch because we didn't we didn't know which way you'd be going or you could be going home. And uh, he said, All right, everyone on the bus, we're going across the hill. We're going across the Rumatakas and I'm going to take you to my local pub in Ekatahuna. And we went, oh, great, what a great way to spend a Sunday afternoon. Beautiful. Save a few beers, sing a few songs with the locals. Turn up there and there's these utes full of bales of hay, dogs barking, kids everywhere. Go into the pub and it's full of families. And we oh, this is wonderful. So we have a couple of pints. And then BJ, the BJ goes, right, boys, listen up, listen up. Is that right? Low and Fitzpatrick, <laughs> yeah, with the McDonald family. We're like, what? He said, yeah, over there. That's the McDonald's over there. So <laughs> there's mum and dad and the kids. And, and we get in the back of the ute and we trundle off down the road and spend cool. the night with them. It was fant- absolutely fantastic. <laughs> great for the locals. Your great for us. getting billeted before an all, <laughs> for yeah. a World Cup. And we were, like, final. I can still remember Lovey and I. <laughs> we were in the kids' bedroom and they, they had two single beers. Liz, Lovey, and I sort of curled <laughs> up. So, you know. Two all black front rowers. <laughs> so, yeah, the single beers. It was fantastic. Oh, mate. But it was, um, <coughs> you know, it was, you know, it must be pretty special yeah. to win. Yeah, 100%. To win. Uh, you know, the inaugural World Cup in your home country at yeah. Eden Park, you know, a place that's so special to yourself. Must be one of your fondest rugby memories. Yeah, I think so. It's you know, it was a it was a Saturday. I remember seeing a sign on the terraces. You know, I think it was only like forty thousand people there. Yeah. Forty two thousand people. Um, which was an improvement from the opening game where yeah. there was only fourteen thousand people. Italy, I remember that, against yeah. Italy. Um and I remember a sign as we walked out before the game. Uh, it said, uh, thank God. Um the game's on Saturday, not Sunday. Michael Jones fan. <laughs> uh, That's of course, he wouldn't play Sundays, would he? Yeah. yeah. But I think it was, uh, you know, as I said, I think the French had played their final. Yeah. Um, Cracking game against Aussie in the, yeah. in the semi and yeah. um, surge in the corner to yeah. win it. But yeah. they, perhaps you think that was their final? Yeah, I think so. And I just think we were, you know, we were in that sort of space, that frame of mind where, yeah. you know, we, you know, we'd beaten Wales by 40 points. Yeah. Week before. It was unreal. Yeah. Um, Nothing yeah. was going to get in the way. No. Yeah. Mate, and that was the beginning of a of a real period of dominance. You know, you went away to Australia in eighty eight, fantastic tour. And I think through that period, sort of eighty seven through to around ninety, you know, twenty, twenty two games on the trot or something around that. And um, you know, won you know, played, you know, some really, really great rugby and some of the players you talked about, um, at the absolute peak of their powers. Um, did you did you realise, you know, like or you mm. you were so focused on just week to week getting the job done? Um, you know, like you say, sort of semi-professional before the game had gone. Professional was perhaps yeah. a, a mantra that you All Blacks had at the time. Yeah, I think so. I think we, as I said, we were um, you're responsible for what you did, yeah. um, and we had probably you know in every position we had two guys that were world class. Yeah. Um, so you know, everyone was pushing each other, and and we were good. Mm. We were good. We you know in '88, no one could touch us. No. We we're fitter, faster, stronger than anyone else, and as you say, we were we were probably ahead of our ahead of our time. Uh, we were doing things that other teams weren't doing in terms of our training techniques, um, and we just pushed the envelope the whole time. And we liked winning, and and we had huge respect for the All Black jersey. '89, much the same. Went to Europe, um, 
you know, a bit of great tour of Do you ever pop on the good, the bad and the rugby every now and again, yeah, mate, and just reminisce? Yeah. <laughs> and, and we enjoyed ourselves, yeah. as you can uh, see on that, you know. Totally. Like you say, yeah. when you said we got along, yeah. I mean, that comes through in volumes. And I just think, you know, I've, you know, being on the All Black Tour this year, last year, you know, being in Wales and, you know, admittedly COVID, um, but those guys didn't see anything outside Cardiff. Yeah. Where in 89, we went to all the valleys, Yeah. you know, and then on Sunday we'd, we'd train on the Sunday morning at the local club and all the kids would come down and we'd have a barbecue, play the guitar, yeah. have a few beers, hop on the bus and go to the next valley. Yeah. And just absolutely brilliant. I, I just I just think that the guys today miss out on so much not being able to do that. And they'd all love to do it. So so we need to try and find a way to get yeah. get those club games back into the calendar. Um, that we can take take the the All Blacks and international teams to the provinces because yep. that's you know that's what's so special in you know, eighty nine and then then by ninety we sort of started to wobble a bit. Um, I think we probably took the foot off the pedal and we started to get a bit, as we say in the All Blacks, get a bit fat and lazy. Yeah. And we took our position for granted probably, and that's everyone. Yep. And you know some more than more than others, and I was probably one of the others that I was I was more than others and. Uh, and you know, took a big upset in that World Cup in '91, where Australia beat us. My God, the game was over at half time, yeah. and we didn't even see that coming. Yeah, I was yeah. going to ask that because I've heard you say a couple times before. Yeah. You know, that complacency that you speak to, does it just sort of all of a sudden it's there? It's like just like we didn't, we didn't need to analyse the opposition because we were so good. Yeah, you know, and little did I know, Phil Kearns was actually better <laughs> than me. I always think Kearns was this little fat hawker from Sydney, you know, and I and I blow me bloody down. He was yeah. much better than me. He's not bad. And yeah. he and he and it and I was just so lucky. I was given another opportunity. Yeah. Um, because the second half of my career from that day on was much better than the first <laughs> half. Well, it's uh, and I I mean I've heard. The Carters and the McCaws and, and that say similar things about 2007, yeah. needed that uppercut, needed that, um, you know, that loss, yeah. that bad experience to have a good stern look at yourself and like yep. you say, you were lucky enough to get another opportunity but it, yeah. it almost took that horrible experience in 91 getting chopped up by Aussie in the semi-final um, to, yeah. to realign. Yeah, and... And you know, I, I still I tell the story of, of seeing Phil Kearns on the back page of the Sydney Morning Herald <laughs> and, it, and this is when I, we were in Sydney on the way home from the World Cup and it had a photo of him holding the World Cup up in one hand and uh, America's Cup in the other uh, hand and it said the world's best, the heading was the world's best hooker now it becomes the world's best sailor. Uh, and yuck. I looked at it and I said, Duck. I said, darling, <laughs> I said, I'm the best hooker in the world. He said, no, he said, no you're a fat bugger, <laughs> literally. And that's what, and we, she said to me, you can't finish like this because I was going to retire, I was 27 years old yeah. and won the World Cup, lost the World Cup, you know, just go and build a house. And thank God for me that, you know, she said, nah, you can't finish like this, boy. You yeah. need to get back out there. Let's talk about that transition. You um, not only, you know, like you say, you took a, your team, yourself, everyone yeah. took a look at themselves and saw they're at, but actually you became captain, like uh, in 1992, I think it was. Just talk us through that process, because not only, you know, um, there was some change in personnel, absolutely, yeah. and some people had come to the end of their journey and some were lucky enough to carry on like yourself, but we also had to change a coach, yeah. a dramatically different man and Laurie Maines, hard South Island, a very passionate all black man. You know, what was your relationship like with Laurie who, <laughs> as it turned he, out, um, you know, how did you become captain and, and how did you get along? Uh, Laurie didn't have a huge liking of, of Aucklanders, especially <laughs> especially in those days. And, uh, you know, his his man was Bruiser, Mike Brewer. Yeah. Without question, Mike Brewer was going to be the all black captain. Yeah. He was the captain of the Probables and no one else. So we'll make Fitzpatrick the captain of the, of the Possibles. Yeah. And and I can still remember um, Mike Mike Brewer blew his calf during the game of the first half, I think. And he came up to me and he went, Fitzy, I'm gone. I've blown my calf. And I thought, oh, okay. So if you're not going to be the captain, <laughs> who's going to be the captain? <laughs> who's on here? And it was literally, literally, Laurie didn't have a choice. There was yep. literally no one else. And I, I didn't even want to be captain. Yeah. And and they named, named the team and, and I was the captain. And our centenary year... That's right. 1992, 100 years of all black rugby. We're playing a World 15, and I was the captain in a three test series against the World 15, who were bloody good. They had a great team, yeah. and BJ was coaching them, and I was the captain of the. And 
And I thought, my God. And then we selected the team, and I was saying, Christ, we're not going to beat anyone with this team. Yeah, whole lot of new faces. Yeah, and, whole yeah. lot of new faces. And I think it was almost Laurie saying, you know, good people make great. We're talking yep. the All Blacks now. Good people make great teams. Yep. And Laurie was prepared to sacrifice, um, you know, talent for for getting what he thought was the right people. Yeah. And you know, at the end of the day, and it took took a few years. Yeah. Uh, we got the right people, got the right team, and and he turned it round. And I, I take my hat off to Larry, but it took you know probably a year for him and I to even gel. Yeah. To even you know be able to you know it was that tour of South Africa. I suppose we, we went to uh, Australia after the series here, and we played Ireland, and we just beat Ireland too. God, I thank God for that, and. And Laurie named the team for Australia, and Bruiser was Bruiser was in that team, yeah. and he kept me as captain, which was a sort of a vote of confidence. And then we sort of just took off from there, really. Is um, was it in the end the thing that bound like you and Laurie together was actually passion for the jersey and the willingness to improve, like wanting to improve, <laughs> like for whatever you know. It seems like back then was the height of parochialness. You know, it's almost mm. that provincial bias or perceived p- provincial bias that doesn't exist as much now maybe it does no. maybe it doesn't but yeah. you know we're very much before super yeah, rugby and I think and, you know yeah I think you Laurie, hated Auckland because yeah. they won too many Ramfley Shield games in a row and yeah and I think you know there was a bit of bad blood between Auckland and Otago in those days and yeah. in terms of what happened off the field probably and in terms of the, the coaches and stuff so um, I think it took Laurie a while to get sort of over that sort of north-south divide and yep. and you know to pick Zinzan Brook yeah. I, had to, I had to literally hold him on the ground and say, you have to take Zinni to, <laughs> you know, to, South, to yeah. South Africa. And you need to take Robin Brook also. Yeah. Oh, I'd never had that guy on my bloody team there. No. And ironically, they ended up, bloody, he, he was almost the first pick on every sheet that yeah, yeah. Laurie would name. So it was a bit, bit of both sides, yeah. you know, because uh, technically he was an outstanding coach. Yeah. Outstanding. You know, just, and and we'd, the stuff we were doing, we'd, we'd never done that in Auckland. Yeah. You know, hitting rucks and ruck machine. What's, what's that thing? That's a, ru- <laughs> that's a ruck machine. <laughs> we'd, ne- we'd never seen a ruck machine. We'd never done down and ups. Like, we're not doing down and ups. But ironically, it just made me. I was the fittest and fastest I'd ever been. Yeah. I've never been that fit. Brilliant. Um, so it all came together and it just it took us a while. We had some, had some bad days. We had some good days. Uh, but slowly, you know, if Foxy played badly, if I played badly in the early days, we'd lose. Where as we got better and better, the Frank Bunces of the world came along, the Walter Littles, um, you know, Aaron Penne at number eight, just outstanding, yeah. you know, uh, Jamie Joseph, outstanding. But, you know, it was just like, wow, they, they can't be All Blacks. But they turned it out to be great All Blacks, you know. You, um, you did become the captain. Like you say, you built a respect and rapport with Laurie. The team started to mould a little bit, and you were lucky enough to be captain for a couple mm. of the most significant moments in our history. Firstly, the return test, I think they called it, 92 versus mm. South Africa. I mean, as a young guy, you, you were brought up on watching some of the classic series with Brian Williams and, and yeah. BJ and that, um, whether it be here or in the Republic. Did you ever think you'd play South Africa? You know, because no. for, for, for a large part of your career, it wasn't an option. It couldn't be done, and, no. and it almost felt... It almost happened overnight. It didn't quite happen overnight, but all of a sudden, South Africa were back on the scene and, and New Zealand were off to the Republic to play a game of footy. You know, like, talk yeah. us through that experience. Well, I just I grew up watching, you know, 76. It's, a, you know, sitting on the, yeah. the early hours of the morning with Dad watching watching the All Blacks in South Africa. Um, never, ever, as you say, I never, ever thought I'd go to South Africa as an All Black, uh, let alone captain the All Blacks back there. And it was a dream come true. Because they're for me, and, and no disrespect to everyone else, but they're there for me. They're our ultimate uh, team that we play against. Uh, they're our greatest foe. Yeah, uh, still is today, I think. And and to go there and play against some of my childhood heroes, and play against, to play against Nas and Danny Herber, yep. uh, Ray Mort. Uh, they were like myths as well, weren't they? Because yeah. it wasn't the TV coverage no, and all that sort of no. stuff. There were names you heard of, but yeah. you didn't really see. And no. all of a sudden, you were yeah. you were lacing up against them. Yeah, to go, you know, to arrive in the Republic and the crowd at, at the Johannesburg Airport when we arrived, just thousands of people, just so happy to see us back in the Republic. Um, and you know, to the first then we we met Nelson Mandela, um, which was this was early on yeah. in the piece, and just wow presence presence yeah he just, had an amazing presence greatest you know I got to see him a few times over the years, 
Um, he was the founding patron of Laureus. Uh, he came to uh, when we first started. Um, but just he's, he's the greatest man I've ever met yeah. you know, in terms of what he did and um, the way he led that country. Um, yeah, in the World Cup final, we'll probably talk about that in a minute. Um, but 92 was special. You yeah. know, go to Kings Park, as I said, and that was to, to, to run onto that stadium. And the noise when we ran onto the stadium, just and that was cheering us onto the stadium, saying it's so good to have you back in the country. We love you because I love the All Blacks. Yeah, um, and uh, it was good to be part of part of that. And uh, and 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 for us, it was sort of a, a real stepping stone to beat South Africa um, in South Africa. Um, it, but they hadn't played for for a number of years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it was still really important for the development of that of that team in '92. We're um. You know, like you say, we'll, we'll get up to the World Cup. 93, yeah, the Lions tour, we managed to win that 2-1 mm -hmm. after after getting a bit of a hiding in the second test. Yep. Like, 94, South Africa came out here, managed to get your ear bitten off, managed to win the <laughs> test series 2-0. But then also that year we lost 2-0 to the French. They scored the, the try yeah. from the end of the earth yeah. and, and was still a strong footy side. But the, the question is, you've been captain for a few years now. And actually, you know, when you when you talk about All Black history, yeah, some some good wins, some some big moments, and like you say, a team developing under Laurie with some yeah. some players that were starting to to really mature and come pretty exciting. But there were some defeats in there. There's some hard stuff. Like as a captain, you know, how are you handling it? What, <laughs> what sort of captain were you developing into? Because uh, I can imagine, you know, even today, it's it could probably it's a pretty difficult position. But these, I feel like they sort of spread the leadership load a little bit, and there's a, a big focus around trying to. You know, get around the leader, but you at times um, it probably was a lonely place, wasn't it? Sometimes, yeah, you know, did you have people you could lean on? Yeah, yeah, we did. Yeah, I was, I was fortunate, and yeah, especially in the early days with with Grant Fox and J.K. and and those sort of guys. And I think by then Laurie and I was sort of developing a bit of a rapport in terms of you know we had Earl Kurt on there too, which was which was great. He yeah. was a, he was a good balancing act between between Laurie and, and myself. Um, but yeah, we just we were learning in terms of what players fitted the mould, yeah. really. And and some were, you know, even that game that we lost in Eden Park, we probably should never have lost that game. No. Um, the one in Christchurch, we deserved to lose that. Um, so it was just it was literally a learning curve about you know fi finding what players, and that's what Test rugby is about. The test tests you. Were you a um? You know, when Ziddy did a drop goal, did you tell him to stop doing that? Were you a <laughs> you a shouty captain? Were you a lead from the front captain? Were you no. a you know like um sort of you know just? I, th I think in those in the early days, as I said, when when I played badly or Foxy played badly, um, we didn't have many leaders. And then I look at the team, sort of the ninety five, ninety six team, ninety seven team, it was just just full of leaders. Yeah. You know, you think of the teams that Richie captain especially that 2015 team which I think was probably the best team he captained yeah um, you know one to 23 could all make decisions and to be honest tossing the coin is about as, as difficult <laughs> as it got for, yeah. for me captaining the All Blacks but, yeah. but it was yeah you needed to be good at what you did and that's you know you think about All Black captains the best All Black captains are the ones that are one of the first names on the team sheet yeah, yeah. the best at what they do yep. and you know I look at you know look at Martin Johnson was he a great captain don't know really, but yeah. Jesus, he had presence. But he was he was going to yeah, be on the team sheet yeah, every yeah, single Saturday. Yeah, which yeah. I those sort of you know the bucks you know when I think back to the captains I had you yeah. know just yeah you think yeah yeah <laughs> don't yeah. mind following you out. You're my captain. There's yeah. um going into the '95 World Cup and, and we sort of touched on a little bit the uh, like like we went into that World Cup not necessarily the first mm. or even second no. best team in the world. You know no. perhaps it would have been the third or the fourth team, and probably came in under the radar a little yeah. bit or certainly wasn't um, considered a favourite. But did you, going into that tournament, did you feel, you know, that the team was in a good place and actually were a real chance here, or was that something that grew throughout the course of the tournament when you started playing yeah, some think, good I footy? I think was, there was, as you said, there wasn't a lot of expectation on us. Um, you know, we, you know, Laurie had had a plan, which not many people had done in those days. You know, 92, he said we are going to be the fittest and fastest team yeah. By the '95 World Cup, um, unfortunately, we weren't the strongest, um, but we were, and and we played a style of rugby that no one else had ever seen before. Yeah. Really high tempo, quick turnover, move it wide, and our little nippy wingers of of Eric Rush and Jeff Wilson were going to score the tries. Yeah. We didn't know about Jonah at that stage because <laughs> <laughs> he had been dropped. Um, 
but that's and we went to the World Cup as you say under the radar. We just did our job. We you know we were lucky. We were based on the high belt in Johannesburg, totally comfortable, um, and played some great rugby early on and got and gained a bit of momentum. And we all sort of we all sat there thinking we want to play England. Well, it comes semi-final time, we want to play bloody England. Was that because of that, the year before, the defeat yeah, at Twickenham, well, 90, and they 90, sort of yeah, let you know about it a bit? Yeah, 93 we got beaten, Yeah, and they went very nice to us afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we basically, I can remember, remember Ole sitting next to us in the bus, and as we drove out through through the West Car Park, and they were sort of giving it to us, all the fans, and and then at the dinner afterwards, the, the team, um, and we just sat there, took it all, and I can remember Ole Brown saying to me, he said, Fitzy, this is never ever going to happen again. How good! And and that's what we we just had this all call amongst the team. Remember, remember ninety three. Yeah, it's all we spoke about. It was yep. like remember Nant. Yeah, for that eighty six team. Remember Nant. Um, it was remember ninety three. And and you know obviously Jonah had an outstanding game in that semi final. Um, but the team played well. We played that style of rugby. Like you say, you know, there was Mertz, there was Josh Cronfeld, there was Jeff Wilson, there was Glenn Osborne, there were some guys who really put their names up for mm. the first time and showed that they were outstanding All yep. Blacks. But actually, you know, now, you know, we don't even think about it, but, you know, in 94, you know, Jonah was nowhere. He sort of played his first games dropped, yeah. against the French. It didn't go well. The team didn't play well. He didn't see mm. a lot of ball. Um, he got dropped, like you say. Mm. You know, we didn't know the health issues at the yep. time, but he, he couldn't get a level of fitness up that, that Laurie was after, who mm. was such a hard taskmaster with the fitness. And how did he actually get back into the team for 95? Because, like you say, for a lot of the time, we thought it was going to be Wilson and Rush or Osborne or, yeah. you know, a, a different makeup. So we went to, I think we were in, uh, where were we, in Hamilton or Taupo? Um, and we had a, a serious camp in sort of January, February. Jonah couldn't. We're trying to trying to load fitness, and he just couldn't couldn't load fitness because we didn't know he had this health condition. Yeah. Uh, so Laurie sent him off to play sevens, and it wasn't until Rushy got injured um, in the All Black trials, I think it was in Waikato, that Jonah got literally pulled back off the plane and brought back into the team. Yeah. So the style of rugby we were playing for these little nippy wingers. Um, just gave Joan a, a free license, um, and you know the rest is history. In terms of, in those days, we didn't have the same defensive systems. Uh, they, they, we just created space for him, and he he ran ran wild. Would you say? And you've hinted it a little bit, but you know, with it almost, you know, I think that sort of. Um, you know, the team picking Jonah, I think he he as well. He just grew in confidence, mm. didn't he? The team was building, and was was that sort of twenty thirty or first half against England, perhaps you know the best thirty or forty minutes of, of All Black rugby you've been involved with? Because for no. a period of time there, um, you know, yeah, it think, was flowing, wasn't it? Yeah, I think so. I think you know, I look at that game in '96 actually against Australia at Athlete, uh, Athletic Park. In the rain, was, that was yeah. pretty special for 80, was. 80 minutes. That was, um, but. Yeah, I just think that style of rugby we played, and the game was over after twenty minutes. Yeah, and um, yeah, in, in every facet of the game we were dominant because they were a good team. That's yeah. what people forget. England yeah, yeah. in '95, Johnson, Carling, oh, they were good. Yeah. They they had all Rod the, Andrew, they had all yeah. the, they had a huge Ford pack. Underwoods, yeah, Bayfield, good loose, loose fields. Dean Richards, Ben Clark, huge men, weren't they? Yeah. Big team. Yeah, and and we weren't big. Yeah, people, people don't realise. Yeah, you know, we had. Ian Jones, who yeah. was you know nothing at 100 kilos, probably dropping wet. Yeah. You know, Robin Brook wasn't overly big. Um, yeah, totally. You know, Olo, myself, and Dowdy, not huge compared to them. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so it was a, it was a good win, but unfortunately, it all changed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to. I mean, it's it's so well documented, and we don't need to go through it all. But you know, and can you actually remember the match itself? You probably remember everything around it and everything, but but like, because it was it was almost. It was the last significant match of amateur rugby mm. as well. Like you know, it literally yeah. was at this yep. time when rugby changed from amateur to professional. Yep. And, and when you talk to some of the players like yourself, talk to to Cromfeld and Ian Jones, and some of the boys were there. Some of the things that were going on as well were a throw to amateur footy. You know, like um, you know, with the the car alarms going off and the you know, like the all of a sudden, you know, the All Blacks was. Everyone's favourite second team in South Africa until the final, yeah, and then exactly. and then the, the atmosphere changed and and the environment got a lot more hostile. You know, as you'd expect for a final in, in another country, but it literally was when you look back now, 
it was the last game of the amateur era of real substance, you know, like it was a yeah. complete change. And I think, it, you know, for us, we, you know, I, I look back in hindsight and just think maybe we should have just, rather than going back to, to Santon, to Johannesburg, we probably should have gone and, you know, stuck ourselves on a game farm, you know. Yeah. For three or four days just to get away from the... Because everything changed, literally. As you said, it went from, you know, you know, 40,000 people cheering for us and 4,000 people cheering for South Africa to literally 46 million people yeah. cheering, cheering for South Africa. Yeah. And once Mandela stood up and said, one team, one country, yeah. um, it all sort of changed. And we, we literally couldn't go anywhere. And as you say, the car alarms, people ringing us during the night, which is all fine. And that... You know that, that shouldn't have affected us. Uh, Jaina literally, literally, Jaina couldn't go outside the hotel. Yeah, uh, It just turned into this, this global superstar yep. over, overnight. Um, and, then, and then the food poisoning in terms of you know the team getting sick on the Thursday, Friday sort of no team run. Just took it easy no, on Friday. Friday everyone was laid out. Yeah, everyone was like sixteen of the twenty one couldn't get out of bed. Yeah. Um, and we literally we didn't we went went to Alice Park. And literally sat on the ground, and, um, which is fine. That was fine. That didn't really worry me. Um, but just the, the in sheer intensity, you know, the Mandela moment when he oh. came onto the field. Um, I just look at back at that and I think, my God, just the, the electric, you know, you talk about great sporting moments. Oh. Well, that, that must be, well, that probably was the greatest sporting moment I'd been actually involved in yeah. uh, as, a, as a player, without question, just the the power that he brought to the stadium. Can't think of another moment where no. politics and sport yeah. crossover yeah. more, you know, like I just, the, I always, the low always, flying I planes. I used, to, and... I used to joke with Jim Bolger, who was, our <laughs> then, who was then our our Prime Minister, and I said, oh, Jim, just imagine if you'd walk down the tunnel wearing, wearing my jersey. <laughs> no disrespect, Jim, but I don't think yeah. it would have had the same effect yeah. on us. I'm sorry, mate. Yeah. Um, I think but, Nelson might have got you there. Yeah, but, but, yeah. Uh, but just, I mean... You know, the, the final, you know, we we were still on the final. I totally. said I said you know Mertz, Paul, I love him. He, you know he said God, Fitz, he said one minute to go. He said I literally, literally missed that drop kick that yeah. would have won us the game. Yeah, in real time. Yeah. Um, so, have couldn't... you watched it since? Fitzy? I haven't. I haven't, haven't watched it. No, no, never watched it. No, no don't. desire. <laughs> never, never watched that movie Invictus. Uh, yeah, no, I don't. Cause That's rubbish. Cause I, I, I know. I know what happens in the end of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know the ending. Yeah. Um, but uh, but in, in saying all that, Rob, as I get older, uh, a life changing experience yeah. just to be involved in that, and just to, and especially with with what Laureus does yeah. now, and what Mandela said to us that you know sport has the power to change the world. It's your yeah. duty to go out and make sure that you spread the word, and that's what that's what rugby did that day. Yeah. It unified a nation, which could never have been done without without sport. Yeah. And, 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 and the foresight of Mandela to see that, you know, to use sport as a mechanism for change, um, was just, just unbelievable. It's, a, it's an awesome thing to say you're a part of. And, mm. and, and like you say, you know, actually, we were very much at the races that day, but we just we didn't quite get there. But it was, again, a massive prelude to 96 where it almost it went up a step again, didn't it? Like that team really came together. I know um, it was the end of... Of um, of Laurie, but he deserves a huge amount of credit for the work he did for those three or four years that led up to to '96 and and the tour back. And you were 30 years old at the time. Mm. Hardy had come in, who mm. you knew pretty well. Were you were you keen to carry on? Like after that, I know you you never make a decision about retirement the day after a game or anything like that. But you know, was there any um, apprehension about no, going on, or you were too well, driven to to you know, I want to get back in there and get stuck in. Yeah, after the World Cup final, we and the game the game went professional. We went to Sydney and played a one off Bledisloe Cup um, against Australia, and, and that Jane had just set the world on fire to that day too. Yeah, and then we went to France at the end of the year, lost in Toulouse, and then and then uh, won the final game. And ironically, this is going back to right back to the Laurie Maine's Robin Brooks story. Yeah. Robin and Zinni carried Laurie off because <laughs> Laurie had announced that he was going to retire. Right. And the two Brooks carried Laurie off on, on their shoulders. <laughs> which is, <laughs> there you go. Um, so Laurie had done a phenomenal job and, and set up 96 nicely. And then and then John Hart got, got selected, who, who had found me as this naughty little boy. And, and moulded me and changed my life. And he, I was, we were building a house. Bronnie and I were building a house in, in Auckland. And I was up on the roof 
and I saw Hardy arrive. And I thought, oh, God, what's going on here? And he's, he went and had a cup of tea. And he said, uh, Fitzy, uh, do you want to be an All Black again? And I was like, oh, I've had this question before. Because <laughs> <laughs> Laurie had asked me this question. I know this conversation. Yeah, Laurie had asked me this question, you want to be an All Black again? Sean, and I said, yeah, I'd love to be Laurie. What are you, too, fat, too slow? Yeah, you're, going to be, you're probably not going to be. So I thought, okay, so so five years on, I've got Laurie, I mean, J, J, uh, JVH asking me the same question. And I said, oh, Hardy. I said, I'm not sure, Hardy, actually. Right. Yeah. I said, I, I don't know. I said, um, I said it took, took a lot out of me, the World Cup, um, but I think I've got a bit still to offer. And he said, well, I'd love you to be my captain if you, if you want to continue. And we had the most amazing year. He is exactly what the All Blacks needed at that time, his professionalism, uh, the way he moulded that team together. We hadn't coached for five years. Wow. Um, but he was very open to everyone contributing. Yep. You know, Sazini and, and all those guys, Michael Jones, uh, Mertz, uh, Josh, all those guys really sort of got him behind. Um, and we took 36 players to Africa. Yeah. Never been done before. Yeah. And, 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 and Hardy did a, did a phenomenal job. We played, I think we played 12 tests, 10 tests in, in 12 weeks. There's, Won um, the Tri-Nations. Um, and then to Africa for that, you know, the four tests there. And it was, you know, you you were one of the older players by then. You, like you say, you've been brought up on the All Blacks playing South Africa, whether mm. it be a home or away. You know, it, was, it probably was pretty easy for you to motivate yourself and some of the older players around, geez, this is a job I want to get done. I want to be part yeah. of the All Black team that wins, for the first time, wins a series on South African soil, which so many great All Blacks yeah, hadn't yeah. been able to achieve for any number of reasons. You know, but did you have to sort of school up the the Murdenses and the Cronfelds uh, no, and some so of these Mertz, lads who Mertz, Mertz sort of knew because of yeah. his you know the history of his yeah. family and yeah. you know being born in Durban yeah born in Durban so Mertz sort of understood um, Josh Cully. Josh <laughs> oh, Cully but Cully had no idea <laughs> <laughs> so Cully I had to say Cully down a few times and, and tell him about <laughs> you know you know a few of those South African games uh, but ultimately. Everyone, yeah, you because know, it does such a ding dong ah, yeah. against South Africa in those days. You know, they were the world champions playing at home. Uh, we'd beaten them up a bit in Cape Town in the uh, in the final game of the Tri Nations. Uh, Francois had been injured, so he he was out for the for the series. Um, Gary Teichman came in, who captained the team, uh, and then we just we just knew we had to win in in, in Durban. Yeah, if we were going to have any chance of winning the series. We had to win that first game, yep. and it was one of the great games of rugby, oh. which is you know, end to end. You know, the well, that's the thing. The, the rugby was great. Like some yeah. of the, the tries that Goldie scored, and, and yeah. you'd have Ian Jones making the final yeah. pass in the wide yeah. channel, and, and you know, Amazing. Zinni with his skills, and yeah. John Preston coming on JP and, and kicking, that goal. kicking penalties yeah. from off, after being on the field yeah. for what a minute or two. Yeah, you know, like so we had a like we had two teams. It was literally we had we did have yep. two teams and. And we made a, a pact that we would win every game we played on that tour. Yeah. And we would support the, the Wednesday team. They'd support the Saturday team. Ultimately, their goal was to get in the Saturday team. It was our goal to not let them get in. So yep. we all played better and better. Um, but we all got on really well. Uh, and as, as I said, Harty and the management team just did a phenomenal job. Yeah. Uh, because that's, I think, what some may not realise is to take 36 and run two squads and, and sort yeah. of create a culture where you're trying to drive each other along hadn't yeah. been done before. No, you know, like that never. was that was different. You know, yeah. like you used to. We had 10 management. <laughs> like in those days, it was like, wow, 10 management. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it was, um, yeah, I mean, it was it was groundbreaking in so many ways. It was the first year of professional rugby. It was the first yeah. year of the rugby championship. It was, you know, and but it was the last tour full tour mm. that the All Blacks ever went on really anywhere but certainly to South Africa we didn't really know that but um, but yeah it was, just, it was, it was great fun uh, we had a lot of fun off the field yeah. and and driven by the results on the field and it's um, I mean we'll you know, firstly talk a little bit about you know when you won the series and, and you were coming off the field well first thing I imagine is you were just stuffed because it looked mm. so bloody hard yeah. but you know, to have, like you say, that other group of All Blacks up in the stand. Yeah. You know, to have former All Blacks. You talk about Jonah, who, um, as I say, we didn't really know, but he'd been dropped. Yeah. Um, and we, you know, put Cully into fullback and, and moved um, Glenn Osborne onto the wing. And 
to walk off and to see the the dirty dirties, the guys who didn't strip, <coughs> there, you know, the blazers off doing a haka led by Jonah. I think really typified, you know, yeah. what sort of person he was, but what the support and what it meant to the whole touring squad. And then for me to, to, to I just loved going over to the, have this big open stand on the on the other side from the tunnel and to see the New Zealand fans. Yeah. And and we had, had these nuns who were dressed up as nuns <laughs> following us it. around. I remember it. And, and to see them there, yeah. uh, ironically, I probably shouldn't say this, <laughs> but one of the nuns is actually on the board of New Zealand Rugby now. There it is. No <laughs> names required. No, no names, names required. He knows who he's, who he's speaking <laughs> about. And then I walked into the tunnel yep. as I was walking off, and Don Clark. The great Don the Clark. The great Don Clark, the boot came up to me and he's living in South Africa at the time he's yeah. unfortunately not with us anymore and he came up to me had tears rolling down his face and he hugged me and in those days all blacks didn't hug each other <laughs> and he said uh, he said Sean he said I just want to thank you thank you so much for beating the South Africans finally in a test wow. series in South Africa he'd never he done said, it a great player like him and he, never said, done it he said I can go to my grave a happy man oh. which just it just showed what it meant That's so um, good, isn't to it? that generation of all blacks yeah, yeah. So good. Yeah. It was, yeah, I mean, it, it was awesome. It was it was so good to see. And like you say, you didn't know it was going to be sort of a final, a final full tour. I want to talk, so you've, 96 was amazing, first mm. year of, of professional rugby. And, and, you know, you, at that stage, you, you were 30, whether you consider that old or, or time to retire or not, I'm not sure, and came into the 97 season. I want to ask you a little bit about, did you feel a little bit, Reinvented because rugby is professional. It's now a full time job. You could you could go play for the Blues, play for Auckland, play for the All Blacks as yeah. a job, and, and mm. didn't have to balance you know some of the other commitments you had in life. You know, was there even thoughts of trying to get through to ninety nine? You know, because Hardy was there. You yeah. you had a good rapport. You yeah. had a good team. I um, think we um, the the money didn't make a lot of difference. Yeah, to be honest, in yeah. terms of the, you know Zinni and I were still you know when we were amateurs we were paying. We were paying for George Duncan, who's now the one of the big masses in the uh, in the All Blacks. He's the boss of that. Yeah, we were paying George in '93, '94 to yeah. massage us. Yeah, right. You know, we had um, we had the guys down at Les Les Mills, uh, Lee Perori, yeah. you know, teaching yeah. us how to use a Swiss ball because we'd never used a Swiss ball. Um, right. We had a, a I had um, uh, a strength conditioning guy down there, which. We were all paying for, yeah. Um, so nothing had really changed, really. And you know, ninety ninety seven came along, and I was as motivated as ever. And you know, unfortunately, I got injured uh, in the Super Rugby season, and never really got over that. I had a bad knee injury, which just you know I should never have had it operated on, probably, um, but did. And then it was, was that tough because. Up until then, I'd never been injured. You'd been like, a bit of an Iron Man. You'd played sixty-three ne- cont- consecutive a, test matches. You know, you weren't yeah. a person that was associated. No. You know, and we had great players like Sir Michael Jones, who had yeah. significant injuries, and other people who had time out, and J.K. Yeah. had his Achilles, and all those things. But you were always a constant who was able yeah. to to run out, and that's one of the reasons you played sixty-three on the bounce. And so I got through, and had uh, had John Mayhew, who sort of kept me going. Um, but just 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 ground and ground, and then after the uh, Tri Nations, um, after the game in Melbourne, I played the SCG, uh, the MCG there. Um, came home and had an operation on, just cleaned it out, and it was never the same. Yeah. And I went and I played a few games of club rugby. Hardy picked me to go on the tour to Ireland, uh, to Ireland and Wales, and. England, sorry, and couldn't play. Yeah, and I can still remember I played half a game against Wales to see if I could, to see if I could be fit enough to play on the Saturday against England in the second test, and came off the field and I said to Zinni, I said walking off it, we played at Wembley, I went Zinni, bloody knee. I said, mate, I can't do what I used to be able to do because this bloody knee. He said, Fitzy. You need to retire. <laughs> <laughs> I went that quite. It wasn't quite the answer I was looking for, mate. I was looking for, mate. Um, on the Monday night uh, on, in London, Hardy said, "Right, we're going out for dinner." I went, "Oh yeah, okay. We're going out to what? Discuss the team for Saturday?" He said, "No, oh, just go out for a, a beer and a bite to eat." And before we even sat down, he said, uh, "You're going to retire." Yeah. I went, "No." Nah. <laughs> he said, "You are going to retire. You're not playing on Saturday." 
I said, no, let me play. He said, no, you're not fit enough. And uh, I said, oh. I said, give me six months. He said, okay, I'll give you six months, but you, you're never going to play a game. <laughs> Jeez, they shot you straight back in the day, didn't they? They really let you know. Yeah, God. and literally it wasn't till, wasn't till March, and I was trying to get fit, and yeah. I was trying to get the knee right, doing everything I could. And on the Friday night before we were going to, I was going to play for university on the Saturday, and Jane Dent had announced that I was, this is my comeback game. And, and uh, Martin Crow rang me. Oh, the late, great Martin yeah. Crow. And Hogan said to me, he said, Fitzy, he said, hey, you've got exactly what I had. And uh, your osteoarthritis in the knee, you're never going to be the same player you were. He said, you need to retire. Sure. And Here it is. best advice I ever got. Yep. And, and that was it. Game over. And it was the best thing I ever did. Yep. Honestly, I, I'd, been, I'd been thinking about, as I said, in 95, 91, I thought about it, 95, I thought about it. And then to have those two great years with Hardy uh, was the icing on the cake. And and if it hadn't been for the knee injury, as you said, I probably <laughs> I probably would have tried to go through to ninety nine. Yeah, which would have been would have been wrong. Yeah, and um, yeah, so and that was it. It was you know as soon as I made the decision, we announced it. Job best, done. Best thing ever happened, and I've I've never I've never missed it. I don't miss playing, right? Um, because I had such a and that's what people and, and I'm sure the same with with great. Well, players that play for a long time for the All Blacks, you actually, you give so much to it Yeah. that I just wanted to have a normal life. Yeah. I wanted to take the rubbish out. I wanted to wash the dishes. I wanted to take the kids to school. All those things that you, you miss out on because to be a great All Black or to be a good All Black, you need to be totally committed to the job. Yeah. And and as soon as you're not, um, that's when you're going to get moved on anyway. Yeah. Uh, but it takes a lot out of you. Mate, you were one of the great All Blacks. Like a, such a great career, and and you know it's been awesome to reflect on it. Like today, you obviously spend a little time in New Zealand, but the home is the UK, is it? And and what keeps you busy? Is it the uh, director at Clenethley Laureus? Is it? <laughs> uh, yeah, a bit of a bit of rugby. I'm actually got got more involved. Ironically, when you when you started, you said you were involved in rugby at you know so many changing times, and and during the pandemic, I you know I was approached by by the Scarlets and yep. Clenethley. I was doing stuff with. Um, with Harlequins in, in the UK, and and then I started doing a bit of stuff with with New Zealand rugby, and I thought, why why don't you want to get involved? Because you know there's private equity coming into the game, uh, the game, the face of the game yeah. is changing so yeah. much. There's real opportunity, it's and I, I'm really optimistic about where rugby's going. Yeah, and I was thinking, why don't you want to be part of this? Get involved. Yeah. Um, Why not? You've seen a lot. Yeah. You've seen a lot, yeah, mate. Yeah, so I've really enjoyed it. And, and you know, living in the, the UK and living in the Northern Hemisphere, yeah. there is so much going on up there yeah. in terms of in terms of the face of rugby. You know, the way it's the way it's been consumed now, the way we watch rugby, um, and we we have to create this product that yeah. people are going to want to watch. And we've got such good products. Totally. You know, the Tri Nation. Well, the sorry, the Championship. Uh, the Six Nations, uh, the All Blacks, the Welsh, the English, you know, the yeah. French, the World uh, Cups. It's just it's such good viewing. I totally it? agree. And while, you know, it, it hurts me as an All Black fan to, to watch us lose a couple of games up north um, last year, the, the thing yeah. that it does create is I'm extremely excited about Ireland coming out here in June in a 3T series because yeah. how much anticipation is there for that? Yeah. And you know? we have lifted the bar. The yeah. All Blacks have, have, have been the gold standard of world rugby. And the rest of the nations are finally waking up. Yeah, <laughs> we have to have players that are totally committed. Yeah, that love playing for the jersey. And you know, look what England's doing. Look, at, as you say, look at the the Six Nations. What yep. a great tournament that is. Yep. And quality players. Hundred percent. Right. Last question. Uh, pick me the finalists and the winner of the two thousand and twenty three Rugby World Cup in France. Well, I think the I'm hoping that the opening game will be the the World Cup final. Yes. Uh, I'd love to see France and, and New Zealand play at a World Cup final. Yep. Um, and we're going to have to play well. Yeah. You know, we're, we're, we're a bit off the pace at the moment in yep. terms of where they're at, which is not a bad thing. You know, watching Ireland and the Six Nations, they, they've got a quality team of, of real depth too. Yeah. And that's, you know, you think of the World Cups we've won. We've had teams that any one of our 30-odd players could, could start and we wouldn't be any worse off. So, you know, I think, I think France is the form team in the world at the moment. Yeah. Um, but by 2023, I think the All Blacks will be the form team. I love it, yeah. mate. No, it's it's exciting, isn't it? It's yeah, exciting it's good. to have. Cool. 
um, that anticipation for the big tournament. Mate, thank you so much for coming Pleasure. in. I appreciate it. I know you've got a little bit on, and perhaps we can um, zoom you in from the Northern Hemisphere um, towards the end of the year and, and see where rugby's at in that part of the great. world at some stage. Thank Love you so to. much. Cheers, mate.